Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank you, weather. Thank you, sun. Thank you, gorgeous June, third day. Um, and it's really an honor. S Susan Frakon is my mother. I don't know how many of you knew about that. And um, so I have to say my poetry was very deeply influenced by her. I, I went in a slightly different direction. I didn't, um, being a visual artist would be pretty intense with her as a mother. So I thought, well, I'll just be a poet instead. <laughs> so um, I think I kind of chose some of the poems a little bit with her in mind today to honor, honor her and her great body of work and the magnificent show she's put together. So um, I'm really delighted to be here also with my aunt in the back whose birthday it is today, my son, my husband, and so many dear friends who are also here. So I'm going to read a little bit from um, this book called The Garden of M, which is titled after, I, I stole the title from Philip Guston's great painting, um, The Garden of M. And this poem is called Metaphor Exchange. The sea can be as milk, but milk can never be as the sea, nor can wine. The salt of sea would not serve in milk or wine, but even more so. Milk and wine indicate one sort of state and color, despite wine's own living properties that might make it like ruby or plum. While the sea is as so many artists have depicted, so many aspects, complexities, again, as silver, as glass, as metal, as glinting, as treacherous, as calm, as yellow, or translucent green as in a Turner, or as in a Selman's, thousands of penciled gray waves, each slightly different yet similar enough to create a visual coherence of sea, a meditative thing of infinite elements, a complexity of ex extensive existence, a thing that drops off the ends of the earth, that extends through the core of the planet to reach the other side, that its depths is a blue so impossible as to be black, inhabited by luminous creatures who do not see red, red light wavelengths lost in pressure and distance, and past that vents of fresh earth crust in which more creatures live, feeding off extremes of heat and pressure, and still a thing that washes this planet, makes us unique, unlike anything else, not gas spinning into rings of dust relentlessly blown into again red, a red haze surrounding the sphere. Instead, it makes us deep blue and streaky and many colored edging the blue, dominance of ever shifting blue, most fragile of colors, fading and reappearing from black to silver, to milk, wine. What could be similar to this? Universe as sea? From our perspective, do stars shift in such complex interaction to change from second to minute? Sky again may not contain such active composition of so many dimensions. Though sea imitates sky, and in that way sky leads in color and depthless stability within seconds of change. From here, it may be hard to tell if life is equivalent metaphor. What seems discernibly variable to me may in more distant unfamiliarity seem as symmetrical as an ocean full of waves. So what is C's equivalent metaphor, if not to itself? What is at least somewhat like another? Where, in the distance between one and the other, is the interaction of complex vibrancy edging into beauty? Then I'm going to read one poem from a long series I wrote um, where I was trying to, everyone always disses um, Alexandrines in English, saying that English is inherently unsuited to the 12 syllable line. And um, I do like a poetic challenge, so I tried to take that on. And uh, this is from, it was published eventually as a chapbook called Rays of the Shadow. I too was invited by light, clouds, greenery, and always color. Light is just invisible until it interrupted by solidity. Then it assumes shape. Even if the shapes of dust motes, even if dust becomes light, cities are always illuminated during the night. Buildings are lines of light. 
alternating cross-hatching of light on mass materials reality. Sunrise transitions to sun, quality of adjustment, change to the more familiar, daybreak is always unfamiliar, new and strange. Light fades off buildings and diffuses into time. Again, how actions of water and language are related to light. Whether the motion of water is direct or sinuous, sweep of clouds guides light upward, slight scattering of photons, half sol solid, so half invisible. The quality of water determines quality of light. Rays become visible after finding their objects. Visible or shadow, rays seek us. And then um, I'm going to read a couple poems from my new book, um, To Husband is to Tender. So I'll start with, um, and Susan will know maybe why I'm reading this poem. <laughs> the Bird Husband, well, sorry. Actually, I'm going to start with a little brief translation of Apollinaire that I did. To the sun, because you love it. I was intrigued to remember you well, shadowy spouse whom I love. You are to me nothing, existence, O oh, my shadow of myself. The bird husband, O oh, my shadow of myself. The bird husband only perches at the window and worries over water and stays away from cats and talks to his beloved from treetops and inside shrubs. The dense greenery shields him so only his voice can be heard and his voice can be heard over great distances and his voice varies as song varies and carries over great distances as his voice and what he has to say carries like song over great distances. The sound analysis of his voice reveals amazing things and all the same no one understands what he is saying. He is saying Beware of the poison scissors, beware of marrying ogres, beware of the queen's machinations, beware of the king's apathy. Together they are imbalanced, asymmetrical, and incite in each other a forgetfulness. They forget all their husbands and wives and children, and who is to be trusted, and whether gossip serves as a way to strengthen group bonds, and whether the word gossip is unfairly negative because it is so closely associated with how women communicate with each other. The pages and servants watch the bird wife and bird husband closely and report to each other in a way as to make every small action significant. And yet no one monitors the blue bird singing and braving scissors to fly so far away to fight cats and English sparrows who brutally in their invasive way, peck out the eyes of fledglings. It is for that the bird husband makes a box with a small hole and shimmering tassels to frighten away the territorial sparrows. It is for that the bluebird stays a certain distance from the house. The wound on the windowsill, beware of. Constellation for Ismail. Husband looks out onto landscape foreboding, wife looks out onto horizon expecting, watches from windows the sea. At the time of your birth, I wasn't there. Do stars have lines drawn from them to each finger and toe? Are we held that way to each other and skies? Should it be sky or skies? Is or are they so large as to be multiple? In layers, they assemble protection. Thinly, they assemble home. You pointed out what looks lit in the sky may no longer be, and that gave me a turn. Sense of time traveling along with light and how what I see may not be what it is. Galaxies of space along optic nerve, reception of light along to perception. Good thing we have each other to compare whether yellow is green and to find the right words to indicate blue. So I'm going to um, read a, finish with a few poems from 
I don't know that this manuscript seems to be kind of assembling itself. I've been involved with a fight to save a park in New York City, and the fight has gone very badly. So, so these, I thought, well, even if I can't save the park, at least I can write some poems. <laughs> Not about it, into it, I guess. So I, I'm just going to read a few of those poems. This one starts with a quote from Philippe Jacotet. And the quote is, I cannot close the door of this enchanted place because I have it in my heart. I broke the word at the same place. It was smashed by a rock or a pine cone. A mushroom grew out of it. A woman told me mushrooms are invasive. So I wrote a bee-sized poem and I read it to a bee who seemed uncaring. It chose pollen over my words as city planners choose money and trouble and construction men in their yellow vests and hard hats, millions of them around the park, they love to dig in the park, as I love to cry in front of them and look mournfully with my large black velvet sad eyes at the fences they have set up between them and me. The bulldozer backs up almost to my hands held out and further it breaks upon the forest, its body as yellow as being betrayed. The forest, after everything, has been cut down. A few trees, a few squirrels, some paper on the ground to remember it by. To realize that under city trees is an appalling blankness. First I watched the field I walked over every day be rolled up and put into trucks and taken away. And then the grove of oak trees cut down First their limbs, so trunks stood for a few days like that. Then the trunks cut down smaller and smaller, and then... But I am so exhausted by this telling, as we told it over and over, and no, no newspapers really reported on this, trees being cut down like this. Just people talking and emailing each other and taking photos of the trees and sending them to each other as if they were making discoveries. Then the roots were levered up by bulldozers, and I took photos of this too, especially the one oak tree to which I was particularly attached. I did not realize how a landscape could be so altered, a forest turned to a parking lot. I had never seen it before like that, a flat parking lot that I smell when I walk out on my balcony in the morning. Not that the air was so fresh before because of the highway and the bridge, but it was fresher, it was discernibly fresher. This is still a narrative. It is a story of destruction, but who is reading it? Not the city who forced the destruction, and I don't get the meaning, and I don't know the end. It is strange how a city never really let go of its own history of taking land and doing what it wants with it, no matter what the people living there say. History does continue if it doesn't progress. I don't know what progress means anymore because this destruction is progression. It is all the same history that was never really diverted. Important things came up and then they disappeared. Things we thought would alter the course of this history, like the suspicion that at one end of the park there was evidence of the massacre of a Lenape village and very likely artifacts. The suspicion was codified in a report delivered to the city, but then nobody really cared, although it is strange walking there to think that here the soil is original. There is not much soil left at all, and I grew up here. How strange is that, too? I am unconnected to a city in which I am simultaneously gentrifier and gentrified, living within the same narrow and managed space of the great capitalist experiment. How strange it is. Reality feels strange without trees. The shape of trees left only an air to the oaks of East River Park. I don't know what bird that is. <laughs> the trees, the trees hath been cut. They have cutteth the trees, most of the trees to all of the trees, the remaining trees to be cut. They have hacked, they have sawed, they have mulched. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the trees have been cut. They are all being cut. They are being cut down. The stumps of the trees, the branches sawn off, the circles of raw wood left bare, 
the trees with no leaves, the tree with no branches, the stumps of the trees, the shapes of the stumps of the trees, the shapes against the sky, against all of the clouds, the silver of the tree bark, silver of tree against bare sky, last silver of tree, the tree silvers down, the tree into slivers and splinters, chips and dust. The smell of the trees mulched down into dust, the piles of dust moved into trucks and away to more piles on other islands. Wood dust of all of the trees, dust against the sky, bare sky of trees, the sky bare of trees, the sun bare of trees, sun straight in, the sun comes straight in, over the water with the water and the sun without trees, all the trees that were cut. Here the sun and water straight in and windless air, the trees are now red, the stumps of the trees, the stumps with no branches the red of the trees and no leaves to be seen left with no leaves no branches nor twigs the roots will be pulled the roots will be cleared all of the roots under the ground will be pulled every trace of tree will be gone every chip every scent every leaf every gnarl every nest the tree will be cut the tree has been cut all of the trees have been cut all of the trees are red the blank shape of a tree where a tree was, the sun comes into the blank spaces, the wind and the water come into the blank spaces in the shapes of trees, the smoking shape of where the tree was cut down, the blankness of soil where the tree was once cut, the soil pulled up with the roots under the crown and the soil carted away. The stripping of soil under the roots and the stump cleared away, the small roots and the tendrils and the hairs into soil, all of the soil carted away and down to the blankness of under the soil. What is under the soil of a platform of debris of fill, all of the soil stripped and trucked away after the leaves and twigs and branches have been sawn and the trunk left in rain and then the trunk cut down in circles after circles down to the stump and the stump cut more as close to the soil, as close to the bottom of the stump and into the roots. And then the roots are sawn through in the soil and lifted out with chains and the entire stump comes up and out with soil and its roots and the small roots into smaller hair-like roots and the leaves, nests, grubs and rocks embedded into the net of roots all comes out from the hole in the soil and then around the soil is shovels and shoveled out and the bulldozer comes and grabs the soil and the hole the bulldozer at the edges of the hole makes it large until the soil turns gray and it rains carrying the soil into river and wind blows the fine dust of soil into lungs noses and mouths so goes the soil into how we talk, we breathe, we eat, we eat the soil, we eat dirt, we eat the dust of the new gravel. Thank you very much. Thanks.